the, God, the, the, the book of Daniel chapter 9. Um, we're going to take the first 19 or 20 verses this, this evening. An incredible, incredible passage. If you come to Daniel chapter 9, there's two things that stand out. It's probably one of, one of the, the, the great chapters of the Bible. Um, it, it, the whole chapter on prayer. If, if you were to look at you know, one, of, one of the chapters, you would say, man, you know, show me how to pray. Daniel chapter 9 would be at the top of that list. If you were asking the question, tell me where the prophecies of the Bible are, um, Daniel chapter 9 would also be at the top of that list. We, we're going to cover two different subjects. We're only going to get through the first part and the topic of prayer and Daniel's prayer as he's now preparing his heart as God's about to you know, reveal to him the things to come. And so it's an amazing, amazing chapter. Um, one of the things you, you see in this prayer is Daniel had an urgency in his life to pray. He had an urgency because he started to realize that some things were about to unfold and that, that's really how this prayer begins. Look at Daniel chapter 9 to start in verse 1. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Daniel was somewhere in his 80s at this point. This passage would have been in 539 B.C. And what's, what's incredible is it was in 607 B.C. that Daniel was taken into captivity. So 68 years had, had passed at this point in Daniel's life being in captivity he was you know somewhere between 13 and 15 so he's you know early 80s uh, at this at this stage in his life and he's there reading the book of jeremiah and as he's reading through the book of jeremiah some things began to stand out to him one of the things that he he took note of is as he was reading through the book of jeremiah that the prophecies of scripture were about to take place and I, and, I, and I love that about the Word of God, that the Word of God is living, it's powerful, that it, it unveils things that, that you and I, you know, have no clue about, that God's able to just unfold things before our very eyes. And Daniel realizes as he's reading through the scrolls, you know, in, in, in that time they wouldn't have had you know, Bibles in, in, in the same sense that you and I have Bibles. It would have been the scroll of Jeremiah, the scroll of Isaiah. It would have been these different uh, books that would have been collected. And, you know, you wonder what did Daniel in all of these positions, all the power that he had, you know, I'm, I'm sure he got paid very, very, very well, you know, being that he was there very high up in the government and Daniel had invested, you know, his money in the things that counted. You know, it wasn't, I don't think he was buying, you know, Gucci bags. I, I don't, you know, I don't think that was, he was worried about, you know, how nice his clothes were, you know, what watches, he don't think Rolex or anything was his concern. I think he was, he was investing because he had the scroll of Jeremiah. And as he had the scroll of Jeremiah, he's reading through the book of Jeremiah. And as he was reminded, and his whole prayer reflects that. Because he knows why they got taken into captivity. He was a young boy when all of that happened. He knows why they're taken into captivity. He understands that according to Jeremiah that they would be in captivity for 70 years. Why 70 years? Because God had told the nation of Israel that six years they were to labor. On the seventh year they were to let the land rest. It was a Sabbath year. You had Sabbath day and you had a Sabbath year. And God had prospered them and blessed them enormously. And they decided that rather than letting the land rest like God had instructed them, they would take in more wealth. They would, they would plant their fields, you know, continually. And so rather than doing what God had instructed them to do, they decided that, you know what, we'll just accumulate more for ourselves. Greed. And as their greed just continued to grow for 490 years, they had neglected to follow God's command. And so God said, you owe me. 
one year for every seven years, 70 years. And that's why the land laid rest for 70 years because God said, you guys had neglected to do what I've asked you to do. And so as they were there in captivity, Daniel realizes 68 years has passed. And within the next two years, we're going to be free to go back into Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple and go back to our homeland. Now, you know, it blows my mind because, you know, Daniel reading those things in the scripture, could you imagine all of a sudden you're reading through and you're kind of doing the math and you're just kind of concluding all of these things? Watch, turn, turn, turn to Jeremiah chapter 25. I would imagine he was somewhere in, in this passage. Jeremiah chapter 25. Look at verse 11. And the whole land shall be desolate and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land my words which I pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. So Danny would have been reading, he goes, look, God's, God's going to judge Babylon now. He realizes it. Just a couple chapters later, go to chapter 29. Look at, look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart and I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I'll bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. And Daniel, as he's reading that first part in chapter 25, he goes, God's going to judge Babylon. So what does that mean for us? And then as he's reading chapter 29, he says, you know, he realizes God's going to rescue us from captivity. He's going to bring us back into the land of promise. And God's grace and God's mercy and God's, you know, forgiveness was going to be on display. And as Daniel hears these things, you know, he realizes he's living in the time that the nation of Israel was going to be allowed to go back into the land of Jerusalem. And what's incredible as you look at this whole picture That God has given us his word, guys, so that you and I can know the days that we're living in. You you and I aren't walking through this world blindly. We know know what it ends up like. We we know where this this all concludes. Can, Can I tell you a little secret? The world doesn't end by global warming. Just so you know. That's not how this all ends. It's not because of emissions. (laughs) God is going to bring his wrath upon the world one day. And he's going to judge the world. And, and, And he's declared that clearly. And he's told us that what it would look like as we're getting close to that end and and what you and I can conclude is that the world's going to look like the days you and I are living in. (laughs) It tells us that that lawlessness is going to abound. It tells us that that man is going to not want to do what's good, but what's evil. And the matter of fact, they're going to call what's good evil, and what evil they're going to call good. And we're watching our world. 
And it should cause you and I to, to, you know, have the same response Daniel had. Get on our face and pray. Cry out to God and say, God, you know, help me to finish my course well. Help me to be faithful. Help me to be the man or the woman that you called me to be. And it's incredible because, you know, you look through the scriptures and God expected his people to know the day of his coming, the first time he came. He was holding the Jews accountable for not knowing when he was coming. In Luke 19, 42, it says this, if you had known even you, especially you this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment around you, surround you, close you on every side. You know, God's saying, look, you guys missed the first coming. And you missed it because you were so preoccupied with yourself and with your own pleasures, your own wants, your own rules, your own regulations. You know, you, everything was, you were so busy that you didn't take the time to read the Word of God, to study it. And the prophecies of Scripture that were foretold, over 300 prophecies told concerning the first coming of Jesus. And fulfilled. And it's amazing because, you know, Jesus would, would tell, this is another thing he told them, Matthew 16, what an incredible rebuke. In Matthew 16, too, he said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be fa foul weather for the sky is red and threatening you hypocrites you know how to discern the face of the sky but you cannot discern the signs of the times wow what a rebuke because you 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 know how to tell when it's going to rain you know what the weather's going to be like just by looking outside and looking at the sky and you know just how, you know how, what 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 signs are out there so that you can come to those conclusions and yet you won't even look at the word of God to find the conclusions you know when it comes to spiritual things he rebuked them Daniel here is aware that the prophecies of scripture were about to fulfill and this is what blows my mind Daniel believed it with all of his heart he didn't just read his Bible he believed his Bible he took it to heart. He understood what was about to transpire. Notice what he says there in verse 3. He goes, then, after I had read and I learned that 70 years of desolation in Jerusalem was about to be fulfilled, watch what he says. I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer, supplication, with fasting, with sackcloth, and with ashes. Wow. Guys, this wasn't just a casual prayer. This one just, it, just it, it wasn't one of those, those prayers where, you know, you just kind of like, oh, Lord, thank you for today. God bless you. Amen. That, that wasn't that kind of prayer. He prepared his heart. He prepared, you know, he, he, it, it was something where he was fasting. You know, fasting, I think it's something we neglect in our, in our day. And I don't think we're commanded as some kind of, you know, command to fast. But I'll tell you, fasting is something that Jesus did. It's something that, that the Apostle Paul did. It, it, it's something that the scripture, you know, refers to often. That fasting is the denying of the, of the, of the natural man. And it's preparing your heart, man, so that you can hear the heart of God. As you deny this old nature, its appetites, its wants, and you say, God, I, I just want to hear your voice. And Daniel began to fast. I mean, that means that he, he had kind of taken a little time to kind of this like, man, I, I, I just want to prepare myself. He put sackcloth and ass. Sackcloth, you, you, you ever, you, ever, um, you know, like, like a gunny sack? That, that's kind of sackcloth, right? Kind of put over you, itchy, you know, kind of not, not so comfortable. And, and Daniel put sackcloth and he put ashes and he was outwardly acknowledging, man, God, I'm coming to you for you in, in, a, in, in, a, in a humble, with a humble heart. 
don't want no distractions. I, 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 don't, I don't want anything that, you know, the, the, the comforts of this world or the thing. And, and, and you know, it's, he's, he's really, at this point in his life, he's crying out to the Lord and he begins to pray. I, I like what it says, he set his face toward the Lord has gone. What, what, what does that mean? He set his face toward the Lord as God. Looked up to the heavens. Just said, God, I, I, I need to hear from you. I didn't know your heart and you know your will. It, it just, it, 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 you know, when I read this passage, man, I, I see some passion in his prayer. I see, it was, it, it was, it was something that, that Daniel took, you know, very seriously. That, that he was going to take time aside and just go hear the heart of God. Go seek the heart of God. The face of God. He says he prayed and, he supp- and, and supplication. Prayer is our addressing of God. Just a simple, we're, we're, we're communicating with God. Supplication is asking for God's favor and God's mercy. So he was addressing God and he was asking God for favor. It's also interesting in this passage that he begins his prayer in this fashion. Watch, watch what he, how he prays there in verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and I made confessions and I said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God. His address to God was acknowledging who he was addressing. Because I, I, I think that's important when we come before him, that we acknowledge who he is, because it, that, that's when we, we kind of put things in perspective. I'm, I'm not talking to you know, just anybody. I'm talking to the God who's able great and awesome. Remember when Jesus was asked by his disciples, Lord, teach us how to pray. Just like John taught his disciples, how to pray, Lord, you know, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he says, when you pray, pray in this fashion. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It was acknowledging who God was, our Heavenly Father, that He's holy. And as Daniel's addressing God, he says, God, great and awesome are you. And then when we're talking to God, you know, th- think, think about what an incredible thing that is, that the God who made heaven and earth would bow down his ear to listen to us. The God who created the heavens, stars, the moon, the earth, the mountains, the sea, the one who called it into being and that he would even be concerned to hear what we would have to say and God loves you and he wants to hear from you. He's a great and awesome God. I like how Jeremiah, I, I, I think, remember Daniel had been reading the book of Jeremiah. All these things become, you know, all of a sudden start to be unfolded to him. In Jeremiah 32, we have a prayer of Jeremiah. And I wonder if it wasn't where Daniel kind of learned how to pray. Look, look, look at Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17. He says, oh, Lord God, behold, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power, your outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands. You repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in counsel and mighty in work. For your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his way and according to the fruit of his doing. Not a cool prayer. 
He's just saying, God, you're, you're, you're the one who created it all. You're the one who sustains it all. God, you're great. You're awesome. You're mighty. And Daniel, in that same fashion, God, my God, who's great and awesome. And then notice at the end, middle of verse 4 there, where he says, who keeps his covenants and his mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. You, you, know, what, you, know, what, you know what Daniel's saying? God, you are faithful. You're faithful. You make commandments, you make covenants, you, the, the things you declare, you know, you always hold your end of the bargain. That's faithfulness. And that's who God is. He's faithful. And he shows mercy. Mercy is not giving you what you deserve. Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. And God is merciful toward us. He doesn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. And he says, God, you keep your covenants and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. I love, I mean, what, what, what an incredible reminder in your time of prayer. God, you keep your word always. You're always faithful. You're always right. You're always just. You keep your, and, and you, to those who follow what you say, God, you never have let them down. You keep your commandments. Those who keep your commandments. Look at verse 5. And, and man, again, incredible how, how Daniel prays. Look at verse 5. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servant, the prophet, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princesses, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. Notice who Daniel puts the blame on. Not God. It was them. They were in captivity, not because God had failed, it was because man had rebelled. And it wasn't Daniel just saying, you, he says, we. Because he was part of humanity. He identified with, with, with all of it. No, you know what's incredible? There's two, two men in the Bible that, that never get called out for doing anything wrong. One, one of them's Joseph and the other one, Daniel. And Daniel, even though, you know, never identified any sin that he did, anything that he had, that he had you know, failed in, and none of, none of his, his failures, Daniel says, you know what? We have failed. We have sinned. Committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Because we're all in this together, right? It, it, it's not, you know, what you've done. It's what, it, it affects all of us. And Daniel was also having the ramifications of, you know, all of his, his forefathers, his, 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 his own peers. You know, we're, we're all in this together and we've, we've all sinned and we've all failed. We've sinned against you, God. We failed done wickedly, we've departed from your precepts and your judgments. We didn't take your word seriously. We didn't follow the things you declared in it. We, you know, we, we begin to, to wander. Look what he says, incredible, watch what he says in verse six. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets. Jeremiah, Isaiah. Hosea, I mean, you can go through the whole list of prophets and God said, I would send them prophets and no one would listen to my prophets. There was a famine in the land and the famine was the hearing of the word of God. I think there's a famine in our land. Guys, it's, it's not that, that God's word isn't available. We got, we got more Christian radio stations than any other nation in the world. We got more Christian TV stations than any nation in the world. 
It's not that the word of God isn't available. The famine is that no one wants to hear what God has to say. And what's incredible as you read this passage, Daniel acknowledges we didn't heed the prophets or the kings and the princesses who spoke in your name. And then he says, look at verse 7. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all Israel, those near and those afar off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Man, what, a, what an indictment. <laughs> what an indictment. He says, look, God, we failed. We were unfaithful. You are just doing what you declared you would do. I, I, I love, he, he's going to mention Moses and the, and the law here in a second. But it's just incredible because what he's saying is that, God, you're just in everything you're doing. You're righteous in all the things that have happened. It has nothing to do with what you've done. It has everything to do with what we've done. As they think about that just in our own culture right now. We've been one of the most prosperous nations on the face of the earth. We have had more wealth. I mean, the poorest person in America, you know, is just so much better off than, than, than those in, in, in the third world countries in Africa and, you know, just in South America. You, you know, you, you just look at how blessed we have been as a country. And I believe it's because we had a foundation that was based upon biblical truth. And then we just begin to remove God from everything. Back in the 60s, we take God out of our schools. Can't pray. Can't read your Bible. And now we take him out of the public square. You can't even mention God. In the workplace, you, 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 just the extent of us removing God and then taking it to the, you know, to that extreme. Once you got God out of the public square, then what, what fills that void? Wickedness, evil, immorality, sexual perversion, teaching our our. our, our Children are, are you know, some some of the things that, that's happening in in our, in our public school system is just is just outlandish. Like you, I can't even believe they're teaching five year olds about gender and and sexual you know acts. Fifth and kindergarten, first grade, second grade, sex ed classes explaining things that a first and second grader has no business. Because once you get God out of the picture, then then there, there's there's no compass and then you wonder why we start to see our society fall apart it's not because God failed us it's because we've turned our back on him he's righteous we're wicked We take his word and we just discard it and say, you know, that, that, that doesn't apply to today. And we start to justify all of these, the, you know, the, the, these different preferences that we want rather than what God declares. Then you start to see the ramifications for it. And, Jared, Jared, and D Daniel, you know, acknowledges, you know, all of this is because of our unfaithfulness, not because of your unfaithfulness, God. Can you, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down and counseled with somebody and they, you know, they, they, they want to blame God 
for their problems, for their issues. And then you say, well, wait a second. Are, are, do you even serve him? Do you mean, are you following his path? Is it, wait, well, no. <laughs> so why are you blaming God? You want nothing to do with him. He lets you do what you want to do. Now you're suffering the consequences of your own actions and your own unrighteousness. And then you want to blame God for that? And Dan, Daniel's just, just as honest as can be. I, I, lo I love his heart. I love his prayer. Just like, God, we've committed unfaith. And then we've done all the wicked stuff. God, not you. Look, look, look at verse 8. Oh, Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princesses, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To us belong shame, a face. What, 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 a, what a statement. Again, I, I think, again, Jeremiah's influence upon Daniel. Look, look, look at Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12. He's talking about this long list of sins, and look what he says in verse 12. Were they ashamed when they committed abominations? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall in the name, in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. Because they didn't even know how to blush anymore. Nothing embarrassed them. Nothing was off limits. It was just any kind of wickedness, any kind of perversion, any kind of evil, and, and, it's, and it's celebrated rather than acknowledged as wrong. So he says, look, we should be ashamed. To us belongs shame of face. Our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we've sinned against you, God. That, that's the issue. That's the problem. Look, look, look at verse 9. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Notice the character of God. Daniel understands the character of God. Even though we've done all of these things, God, you're merciful and you're forgiving. All that God is looking for is that we would come and say, God, I've blown it. I failed. I'm wrong. It's all that God's waiting for. And once you acknowledge that, it, one of those you know, passages in the scripture that they just, you know, it's the bar of soap. In 1 John 1, 8, it says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our righteousness and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's wanting to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He wants you to be pure as the driven snow. He wants to take your sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. And it says that he remembers them no more. That, that's God's heart. That's God's desire. But first we have to acknowledge that we need to be forgiven. That we have failed. That, that, that you know, we, we, we've, we've veered from truth. And Daniel says, look, God, you're a God of mercy and forgiveness, even though we've rebelled against you. Look, 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 look at verse 10. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yet all of Israel has transgressed your law, departed so as not to obey your voice. Watch this. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of the Lord, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. No, 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 notice, and I love it because... Daniel is quoting not only Jeremiah, he's quoting the book of Deuteronomy, Moses. And when he's quoting Moses here, he says, look, you said that you would give us a curse if we didn't follow you. And all you've done is follow through with what you declared you would do. 
Had God not brought a curse on them, God would have been unfaithful. Had God not judged their sin, then God would have been a liar. But God doesn't lie. And God is always faithful. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Incredible, incredible chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look, look, look at verse 1. It came to pass. No, it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these things shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed, blessed shall be, you shall be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your of your ground and the increase of your herds the increase of your cattle the offspring of your flocks blessed blessed shall be your basket and your and your kneading bowl blessed shall be when you come in and blessed shall be when you go out the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouse and all to which you set your hand and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he has sworn to you if you keep his commandments of the Lord your God and you walk in his ways. Now, I mean, this, this whole... First 14 verses, God's saying, look, if you do this, I mean, I'm just going to blow your mind. I'm going to shower you with my blessings. I'm going to just give you an abundance that you can't even fathom. But then he gets to verse 15. Watch what he says. But it shall come to pass. If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall it be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, the offsprings of your flocks. Cursed shall be you when you come in, and cursed shall be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed, until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doing which you have forsaken me. Notice. And when, when, when Daniel's praying, he says, God, you gave a promise and you brought the curse upon us because of what we did. And he's recognizing why they were in captivity. He's recognizing why they, they were in the position they're in because they had sinned against God. I like, I, would, I think it was Billy Graham said many, many years ago, Billy Graham said, if God doesn't judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Because we deserve God's judgment. Because we've done wickedly. But God is merciful. And God forgives. And all he's awaiting is for everyone personally to come and acknowledge that they need his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. Notice verse 12. And as he confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what is done to Jerusalem. Think, think and he goes, what happened to Jerusalem? It's, it's unheard of. It destroyed it. Burned down the gates, tore down the walls. Remove the temple. 
all the gold, all the silver, just, I mean, everything demolished, all of the, the articles that were in the temple taken away into captivity. And he's saying, look, I mean, all of this has happened to us. And it's, it's because you said you would do that if we did what we did. No, notice, notice, look at verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind, brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is written this day. We have sinned and we have done wickedly. Wow. What a prayer. What a prayer. I mean, you know, D Daniel's just, just laying it all out there with the Lord. He's saying, God, this is what we deserve. We got what, what was coming. You said you would do this, and now you've done it, and it's all because of our action, not your action. You're righteous. You're good. I love verse 16. Oh, Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. God, let your anger and your fury be turned away from Jerusalem. And guys, you know, one of the things you find as you're going through scripture and, and as we're looking, you know, from chapter eight, chapter nine, as we get all the way through, God is going to be dealing with all of the nations and all the things that pertain to, to Israel and specifically to Jerusalem. The United States isn't mentioned because it, it has nothing to do with Jerusalem. You know what's incredible is we're watching the news take place right now. One of the things that's happening is that China is now sending their ships into, into the shores, to the, just out, outside the shores of Taiwan. Because what they've discovered is that the United States isn't willing to stand any longer. As we let a go of Afghanistan in the way that we did, we left all the ammunition, we left all of our, our military, we left all of our, 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 our millions and billions of dollars worth, the, worth, the, worth, worth the, the, the military equipment we've left behind and our men. And China has just now realized, you know what, Ameri this is what they're saying in Iran right now. This is what they're saying in Russia right now. This is what they're saying in China right now. Uh, we're no longer in an American world. The reports I'm hearing is that if, if China takes Taiwan, that it's going to deflate the U.S. dollar tremendously because that's where that's the only source of our computer chips and in Ta Taiwan is instrumental for America's wealth and once China takes it over it's going to impact us greatly but they no longer fear us I was listening to one one of the the Israeli guides Amir, and he was saying, Amir was saying, you know what? It, everything fits, man, because America has to get out of the way in order for Ezekiel chapter 38 to take place. When all the nations of the world gather against Jerusalem, and then God intervenes, and our allies no longer trust us, nor do they think that we're able to assist them. And so we're in a post-American world power, according to those nations. Incredible. And what you're watching, in, you know, here, what, what God is saying, look, everything's about Jerusalem. That's God's land. That's God's, that, that, that's God's 
real, real, real estate. <laughs> and God's going to protect it. And it's, it's amazing because he understands that God, Jerusalem, you know, even though they had failed, God's plans were never going to fail. God's still going to accomplish his purposes, man. And I love that Daniel understood that, especially as we get through in, in, into the next section. Look at verse 17. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine in, on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city, which is called by your name. We do not present our supplication because before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Oh Lord, hear, oh Lord, forgive, oh Lord, listen and act. Do not de delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Wow. As Daniel closes his prayer, he says, God, do all of these things for your sake, for your name's sake. And I love, you know, Daniel understood the heart of God. How, how important is it? The only way you and I are ever going to understand the heart of God is if you and I spend time in the word of God. I get the question all the time, how, how do I pray? You know, what, what, what should my prayer life be? And, you know, do, should, I, should I pray and then read my Bible? Or should I read my Bible and then pray? This is what I would encourage you. You, you, want, you want to develop your prayer life? Before you start reading your Bible, say, God, help me to understand what you want me to hear. And then use God's word to begin to pray through. Because that's where you're going to learn the heart of God, the nature of God, the character of God. You're going to learn the will of God, the purposes of God, the plans of God. It's all in his word. And you begin to pray his word. You begin to pray, God, I want to be in agreement with you. I, I want my, my prayer to line up with what you declare to be true. And as you're praying God's word, as you're praying it because you're in line with what God declares, I, that's all that Daniel did here. Everything he's praying, it's in line with, with what God has already declared. If you're praying for something that contradicts what God declares, then, then your, your, your prayers are, are, are not going to be answered because you're not praying in the will of God. You're, you're not here to try to change God's heart. You're trying to get God to change your heart. That's what prayer is. If you're making a decision and it doesn't line up with God's word, understand you're making a wrong decision. Right? You can't pray, God... Bless my marriage, even though you told me not to marry this guy. You can't pray that. It's not going to work. God says, don't be unequally yoked together. No, but I just, the Lord just gave me a peace about it. No, he didn't. That's not, that's not God's peace. Because <laughs> God told you to not yoke yourself to get to, together with someone that's not a believer. So you're saying God's contradicting himself? Who do you think's a liar? Not God. And if we line our prayer up with God's word, then, then we're going to be praying in, you know, in, in line with, with truth. And I, and, I, and I love that this passage, because all, all that, that he lays out for is, God, that your will be done, that you would accomplish your purposes. And I love it. He says, Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us. Lord, act. Don't delay. We'll, we'll take one more. Look at verse 20. And this is more of a tactic of a drug addict. I'm going to just tease you here. Because you've got to see what's happening next week. Next week, this next prophecy. I don't know how many weeks we're going to spend here because of all the things prophetically happening. But next week, watch this. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mount of, of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. This is what's incredible. Daniel's praying. And as he's praying, it says, Gabriel, an, the angel Gabriel comes down. And he's going to show him 
the things that were going to transpire. And he shows them all the way to the end of the age. The rest of Daniel chapter 9. All of the most important events in world history he lays out. The coming of Jesus and the second coming. Incredible. Incredible. I just Again, I, I don't know how many weeks we'll spend here, but... It, it is, it, it's a fascinating study, especially if you're into prophecy. And I, I, I pray that you love prophecy. I pray that, you, like, like Daniel, when he started reading the Bible and said, man, this is about to happen. And it, it stirred something in him to get on his face and begin to cry out to God. And that that same effect would be upon our lives. That, that you know, you and I are, are reading prophecy and you're going, man, th- th- this, is, this stuff is real. This stuff is, is happening right before my very eyes. Man, I need to get on my face. I need to do what Daniel did, set my face toward the Lord God and make requests by prayer and supplication. And that it would be a genuine, heartfelt, I, 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 you know what, I, I think if we're looking, guys, at our generation, we're looking at our world right now, that you know what people are looking to? They're just looking for people that are genuine, that are real, not just, just putting on some show or fake. There's a lot of facades in our world right now. Everyone wants to, to, to try to pretend there's something that they're not. And when, when someone sees something genuine, like, you know what, that, 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 that's the real deal. That they're, 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 not, they're not trying to, trying to pull one over my eyes. They're not, they're not trying to you know, act like something they're not, that you're just, they're just being real. This next generation is longing for that because they've grown up in a world that everyone's just putting on, just show. And that you and I would be people that, that genuinely believe the word of God and then genuinely cry out for God to do what he's going to do. And pour out his spirit and do miracles and, and accomplish great things and stir hearts and change lives and bring conviction. One of the things I, I love about this chapter, Daniel was convicted. We're in a world that doesn't want to be convicted. I, you know, they, they don't want to feel like, I don't, just don't want to feel bad about anything. You need to feel bad about everything. That's against God, right? And Daniel was just just simply, look, God, we've done all of these things. We've failed in all of these ways. But God, I know who you are. I know what you're capable of. I know, know, God, that you will fulfill your promises. I I know that you're able to bring us back into the land. And and it's, it's an incredible picture because Daniel is there when the first wave of people begin to make their journey back to Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Daniel's already probably at that point in his 90s, you know, late, late, in, late in life, you know, late, late 80s at the least. And, and, and Daniel doesn't make the journey back, it don't look like. But Daniel was there going, man, God, you promised and you did it. Just like you said you would. Because you're faithful. And may God give us that same, that same genuine passion in the days that we're living in. Because, guys, things are happening right now. Our world is changing right now. And you and I need to be ready for whatever that's going to look like. 